Congratulations, sir, on a very big win. Let's get right to it. In 2009, you said you supported a peace deal that would recognize a Palestinian state, but the day before Tuesday's election, you completely reversed that. Why? I didn't. I didn't retract any of the, the things that I said in my speech six years ago calling for a solution in which a demilitarized Palestinian state recognizes a Jewish state. I said that the conditions for that uh, today are not achievable for a simple reason. Abu Mazen, the leader of the Palestinians, uh, ha- rejects consistently the acceptance of a Jewish state. He's made a pact with the Palestinian terrorist organization Hamas that calls for our destruction. And the conditions in the Middle East have changed to the point where any territory you withdraw from is immediately taken up by Iranian-backed terrorists or by ISIS. It's only a dozen miles away from us, ISIS. It's thousands of miles away from you. So the conditions are that we would uh, vacate territory and that we, instead of getting a two-state solution, we could end up with a no-state solution. That is, a solution that would threaten the very survival of the state of Israel. I said we have to change the terms uh, because right now uh, we have to get the Palestinians to go back to the negotiating table, break their pact with uh, Hamas, Uh, and uh, accept uh, the idea of a Jewish state. And I think that's what the international community should be focused on. In in the wake of your statements earlier this week, however, President Obama, he apparently sees a difference because he's now reportedly uh, saying that he sees no path to a peace agreement and is threatening to abandon Israel at the United Nations, which would reverse decades of history. What would that mean for Israel? Well, I hope that's not true. And I think uh, President Obama has said time and time again, as I've said, that the only path to uh, a peace agreement is an agreement, a negotiated uh, agreement. You can't impose it. In any case, you have to get the international community to uh, press on the Palestinians to go back to go back on their unity pact with the terrorist Hamas and come back to the table. Uh, I think that uh, you can't you can't force the people of Israel who've just elected me by a wide margin to bring them peace and security. Uh, to secure the state of Israel, to accept terms that would endanger the very survival of the state of Israel. I don't think that's the direction of American uh, policy. I I hope it's not. And I look forward to working with uh, President Obama to see how we could advance our interests, uh, our common interest, in in the most difficult circumstances uh, in the world, in the most dangerous region in the world. And what I said before, six years ago, about the conditions necessary for achieving peace is ten times uh, more relevant today when the entire Middle East is being swept by these uh, radical Islamic uh, terrorist forces backed by Iran. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need to talk together and see how we can work together to advance uh, security and peace. The AP is reporting today that the draft nuclear deal would force Iran now to cut its centrifuges that could be used to make a nuclear bomb by 40 percent from 10,000 to 6,000. Washington originally wanted a limit of 500. Are we conceding too much? Well, I, you know, I spoke in, in Congress a couple of weeks ago, and I said that we need a better deal, a different deal, because this deal would leave Iran with sufficient capability. 6,000 centrifuges enables them to break out to a bomb very quickly. If I had my druthers, if Israel had a seat on the table, I would say zero centrifuges. But uh, I don't have a seat on the table, and if I can impress on the negotiating partners, I would say what our Arab neighbors say. Get a symbolic number, and 6,000 is certainly not symbolic. Uh, That's an agreement we wouldn't like, but we could live with, uh, I said literally. Second thing is, you impose restrictions on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Don't lift them in a specified time, but after you see that Iran actually changes its behavior, that it stops its aggression in the region, stops being the world's foremost practitioner of terror, uh, and stops threatening to annihilate the state of Israel. These are the two changes that we would would make. Uh, Increase the restrictions on Iran's nuclear capabilities, so you increase the breakout time, and don't lift those restrictions until Iran... Uh, stops fomenting terrorism and aggression and stops uh, calling for Israel's destruction. Mm-hmm. That's the right deal. You, you suggested to the U.S. Congress that the better deal that, that we should strike would be a lot, Iran totally eliminating its entire nuclear program. And, and Secretary Kerry came out and said that's basically demanding capitulation, complete capitulation by Iran, and it will lead to no deal whatsoever. Is that even arguably a realistic demand? Well, I just said that there, we think a much better deal can be done and that a further, much bigger constriction on Iran's nuclear program is possible because Iran, while very aggressive abroad, is 
uh, economically uh, weakened at home uh, because of the sanctions regime that uh, could be uh, maintained or even increased and because of the drop in oil prices. So, uh, you know, you got them to the table only after you applied a couple of years ago, biting sanctions. That's what got them to the negotiations in the first place. And as long as you had toothless sanctions, they just disregarded everything. But the minute they thought their economy would collapse, and that's happened in the last few years because of the tough sanctions that were imposed by the United States and by President Obama with uh, with our encouragement and support, that got them to the table. Now, don't you know? Don't take the foot off the brake. Just pass. Keep on pressing. Uh, I think that's possible, and especially because of the drop in oil. So I think there, there's a lot of leverage that the United mm-hmm. States can use on Iran, and I hope it uses it, because right now succumbing to this deal would la- get Iran an easy path to the bomb, uh, and that would happen, not by violating the deal, but by keeping the deal in a few years. That would endanger the entire Middle East. You'd have uh, a nuclear arms race right. that would be sparked here by other countries, uh, and I think you'd have a, a great danger for the United States and the world when the world's foremost practitioner of terrorism has atomic weapons. It's not a good deal. You know, you in, in running for re-election this week, you urged your supporters to get out and vote, warning that you were in danger, your party was in danger, because, quote, the Arabs are voting in droves, and some called that racist. The White House came out and said that you were divisive and that you tried to marginalize Arab Israelis. Do you regret those comments? That's just not true, because I, uh, what I said was should be taken in the larger context. I, I warned of foreign money coming in to selectively put out, uh, uh, just try to bring out supporters of a, a list that includes Islamists and other factions that oppose uh, the state of Israel. Supported, actually, this list was supported by Hamas. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact uh, that Israel's uh, policy and my policy is to be uh, the prime minister of all Israelis, Arabs uh, and Jews alike. I've been funding billions in, into the uh, Arab communities to upgrade their infrastructure and to better integrate them into the Israeli economy, technology, every walk of life. And the right of every citizen in Israel, Jew and non-Jew alike, to mm-hmm. vote is sacrosanct. You- I wasn't trying to suppress a vote. I was trying to get out my vote against those who were targeting foreign money that was coming in to target a specific group to bring down my American government. American money? I was calling my voters international money all over the place. But, but do you think uh, America, let, there was a question this. about whether I, America worked against you, about President Obama, the White House, in the election. Well, do you think that happened? Individual, ind- individual, individual donors from, uh, uh, from uh, Europe, the United States, and Latin America, the answer is yes. I wasn't talking about that. Uh, and I'm looking uh, forward. I'm not looking to the past. But I want to do. I, I want to make it clear. My policy. I've been raised uh, as a. Uh, I would call it uh, as someone who believes in equal opportunity. I deeply believe that, uh, and I've acted that way. I called on ten days ago. I called on Arab supporters of Likud. I met them in the north of the country, and I said, "Look, there's going to be this effort." foreign-funded effort to get the votes for that party, and I want you to be ready for that and get out the vote when that happens. That's what I was referring to, and you'd be surprised. We got a lot a lot of Arab votes. Not, I'd like to have more, but I consider myself as the prime minister of all Israelis, those who voted for me and those who didn't vote for me. Arabs, Understood. Jews, Understood. Uh, those Arabs who voted for me and those Arabs who didn't vote for me. The same with the Jews who voted for me and those who didn't vote for me. Uh, that's my policy. It always was my policy. And Israel remains the one country in the Middle East where Arabs can vote freely in free and fair elections. That's sacred. That will stay. And my policy will stay as well. And my last question, sir. What does it mean to you personally to wake up each day knowing that Israel's enemies' stated goal is to destroy the people and the country that you love? Well, first of all, let me tell you that I woke up this day, and it's a lot better. A day after the election is a lot better than a day (laughs) before the election, especially if you win. (laughs) Uh, That's the first point on this particular day, obviously. But I wasn't just elected because of any personal desires. I was elected because the vast majority, uh, a very strong majority of the people of Israel want me to lead the country in the realistic and what they consider the responsible way uh, that we've been leading it in in a Middle East that is so dangerous and becoming increasingly so. So they want to make sure that Israel is safe and secure, and that's my obligation. But I can tell you, what I've, I was once asked, what's the difference between uh, the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel? And I said, Megan, that 
The President of the United States, I believe, is always concerned about the security of the United States. But the Prime Minister of Israel, and I can speak personally, of the nine years that I've been in office, there's not been a day, a day, that I haven't thought about the things I have to do to protect the survival of Israel. And that's a difference. We're the country that is most threatened with destruction around the world. And it's my responsibility to ensure that this state, the one and only Jewish state, uh, lives forever. And that's, uh, that's a big burden, but that's why I'm here. That's why I was elected. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time. All the best, sir. Congratulations.